Hi hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure update. It's the 21st of March. Um, quite a few updates this week, some pretty interesting ones across the full gambit of Azure capabilities. New videos this week, just one new video because this one took a huge amount of research and planning and it's what is agentic AI? We hear about AI agents and now we're hearing about agentic and autonomous. So I dive into what is agentic AI and then we look at two examples of how we could create some using low code with Copilot Studio and then pro code, we go and use the semantic kernel to act as the orchestrator to actually create a multi-agent solution. So it's, it's pretty easy to follow and hopefully it will help people understand those broader agent pictures. On to what's new, on the compute side, so it's two retirements for Azure Kubernetes service. So the use of the WebAssembly system interface node pools has been retired, instead just deploy SpinCube to AKS from the marketplace. Also, the GPU image preview is being retired. So now you would just deploy a normal node pool, but use a GPU enabled SKU, and then either install the NVIDIA device plugin or the NVIDIA GPU operator. So you have a choice there. Another Kubernetes retirement is KubeNet. So this is the original Kubernetes network that uses an abstracted IP space for the pods from that of the underlying hosts and the physical network. But it's very messy. It has a lot of limitations. There's a lot of complexities to actually try and leverage it and then use it with different networks, etc. And so a much better option now is the CNI overlay, which also uses a separate IP space for the pods, but it removes all of the limitation, the complexities of KubeNet. So basically you want to go and migrate and start using that. You have three years, so it's not until end of March 2028 that it becomes retired, but definitely for new deployments, you want to be thinking CNI overlay, and even for the existing, if they're longer term, start thinking about that migration. Azure Spring Apps, and we've talked about this before, but that's been retired, again, got three years. This was a partnership between Microsoft and sort of VMware Broadcom, and it's going away. Instead, you wanna leverage Azure Kubernetes Services or Azure Container Apps. Now, Container Apps has native Java features, including certain managed Spring components, so that may be a better fit for you. The Retirement Doc has full guidance and different migration options that you could go and look at. GPU-enabled virtual machines now have hibernation support. Remember, hibernation is just like our regular PC. If I hibernate, it takes my CPU, my memory state, and saves it to disk. That then enables me to fully shut down my PC. It's not running, it's not using any power. And then when I start it again, it restores that CPU, restores that memory state from the file. So I'm picking up where I left off. It's like I never shut it down. Well, I can do the same thing with Azure Virtual Machines. It saves that state to the file, the managed disk, and then restores from it when I start it again. So if I had longer running startup things, more complicated, hibernation is a great option to not lose all of that setup that happens after I started the virtual machine. So it's again, it's just like it was really just put to sleep, but I stopped paying the compute charges when I hibernate an Azure virtual machine. Well now, I can also use it with ones that have GPUs. So it's not all of them today. I think it's the NVV4s and the V5s. It does work on both Windows and Linux. But yeah, any environment where it's like very long time to start up the VM, where it's a very complicated set of things you do, but you want to be able to optimize the cost by stop paying for the computer at certain times, the ability to now hibernate is a really good option. For Azure Container Apps, there's two new capabilities related to GPUs. So NVIDIA had a big conference this week. And NIM is an NVIDIA suite of components and microservices that make deploying AI models easy. It includes these pre-built containers for hosting these GPU accelerated models. Now, what I can now do is if I'm in the NVIDIA API catalog, I can look at the NIM APIs and there's a run anywhere option. And I can now specify Azure Container Apps as that target environment because Azure Container Apps now support directly that NIM format. Additionally, it now supports GPUs in a serverless capacity. And what serverless means is I can scale it down to zero. 
and I get that per second granularity of only paying for it when it's running. It can leverage both the NVIDIA A100s and the T4 GPUs. So those things together make it a fantastic option for running those sort of NVIDIA uh, inferencing models. And also a big announcement around GPUs is this NDGB200 V6. Now these use the new NVIDIA GB200 NVL72 Grace CPUs and Blackwell GPUs. But saying uh, VM is a little bit inaccurate. This is 36 Grace CPUs and 72 Blackwell GPUs in this single 72 GPU NVLink domain. So think a big rack uh, scale system, but it acts like one massive exascale GPU. It's also using new high bandwidth NVIDIA NVLink C to C interconnect between the CPU and the GPU. All of that means it's really designed to deliver that next generation of AI and those frontier models. So it's really geared towards that. Now, I'm not gonna run one in my Visual Studio subscription. I may be able to run it for about two seconds and I'll be done. But if you are in the business of using um, infancy on these very large scale models, maybe some training opportunities, uh, this can be a fantastic option for that. Um, app service, no 20 long-term servicing is retiring um, end of April 2026. Basically, you need to move to the 20, version 22 LTS before that retirement date. And Azure managed monitoring for Arc-enabled Kubernetes has gone GA. Remember, Azure Arc brings the Azure control plane to both OS instances and CNCF compliant Kubernetes deployments. So then it becomes known to the Azure control plane and I can also extend various types of Azure service to those Arc enabled environments. Well now for the Arc enabled Kubernetes, I can leverage the Azure monitor managed service for Prometheus, which automates and manages the collection, the storage, the interaction with all of those Prometheus metrics. They're stored in a special type of Azure monitor workspace behind the scenes. So now if I've Arc enabled my Kubernetes, I can now take this capability and get all those Prometheus metrics into a managed workspace, which can then also use the managed Grafana service in Azure to easily go and interact and query and create nice dashboards around it. You often see Prometheus and Grafana used together. They work very well. On the networking side, so now we have secured virtual hub supporting bring your own public IP in preview. Remember, Azure Virtual WAN, I can have a secured hub by having Azure Firewall deployed into it. So if I have brought a prefix of my own, me as a company's own public IP addresses to Azure, so I've brought that prefix, I can now take an IP from that prefix and leverage it on that Azure managed firewall that makes it a secured virtual hub. So as the customer, I've now got full control and flexibility into that IP address. On the storage side, uh, two things about Azure NetApp files, which remember, use NetApp filers inside Azure data centers to provide this partnered Microsoft and NetApp service. Well, one of the things that they have are these application volume groups, ABGs. And the goal of that is it's very specific configurations and best practices that align to a specific type of workload, in this case, SAP HANA. So what they've now done with this enhancement to the AVG for SAP HANA is I can ha have a zonal deployment where that volume will align with a specific zone where I'm gonna have the specific virtual machines providing that service. It also now supports standard network features which give you things like NSGs and um, user-defined routes and integration with FastPath and other stuff. I can also use a customer managed key for the encryption and They've now introduced one of these AVGs for Oracle databases. So again, it's optimized for use with Oracle. I can do that zonal alignment things. It streamlines the deployment and just general operation. On the database side, so Azure Stream Analytics now has schema registry integration with Event Hub. Event Hub has this schema registry and now what typically you're gonna do is use that as a central schema repository. So like anything can go and look and understand the schema of different types of events that are coming in. 
So Azure Stream Analytics can now be configured to use that Event Hub Schema Registry as a place it can go and look up and leverage schemas from. I'm going to use a managed identity for my Azure Stream Analytics and give it access and permissions to the Event Hub Schema Registry. And once I've configured that Event Hub Schema Registry in my Azure Stream Analytics, I can now easily take an Event Hub input, I can associate it with a certain schema, and then automatically deserialize the Event Hub data into an Avro format that Stream Analytics can easily use as an import and just make it easier to do those integrations. So it's just given me, by sharing that registry, a great consistency and compatibility. Onto miscellaneous. So Chaos Studio has a new role in GA. Remember, Chaos Studio is great for crafting experiments to test the resiliency of my architectures. It can do things like emulate, and I say emulate, it's it's actually going to have the impact on the app. So when we say emulate a zonal failure, although the zone hasn't failed, all of the resources in that zone would become unavailable to my workflow. So you want to be careful where you use this. Don't just try in production for the first time. But zonal failures, resource exhaustion, um, key vault problems, there's a whole set of things it can do. Well, there's now a dedicated role, the target contributor. So they can onboard targets for the experiments. They can manage the capabilities of that target. They can't interact with experiments in any way. But now, hey, if I want a particular group or user to only focus on targets, there's now a dedicated role for that. And that's really powerful, remember, because we always want least privilege. I don't want to give someone a role that has more capabilities than they actually need. So it's all about, hey, the minimum possible permissions to go and do the job. Uh, the API Center developer portal is in preview. Remember, API Center is that developer time experience for APIs compared to API management, which is the runtime. APIs actually work through it. So API Center lets me catalog so then I can discover, I can understand the capabilities and architect solutions to use the APIs. And those APIs don't have to be in Azure. Yes, it integrates very well with Azure API Manager, but they could be in other clouds, they could be on-premise. Well, the Managed API Center portal is designed to help the developers use and create the APIs. It basically gives me easy access to the details and the definitions. I can customize it. I can change the branding, for example, for my environment, and it uses Entra ID authentication for the actual permissions around leveraging uh, that portal. And then, OpenAI have released some new audio models, which of course means I can go and leverage it in Azure AI Foundry. So there's two new speech to text. Uh, there's a GPT-40 transcribe, and then a mini version, a GPT-40 mini transcribe. And both of these are focused on improving the word error rate over the existing whisper models we have. And one of the great things now with these models, it works, for example, in noisy environments. There's also a new text to speech, TTS. So GPT-40 mini TTS. And one of the nice things about this model is not only can you tell it what to say, I can tell it how to say it. And if you're thinking about why is there a mini and a non-mini for the speech to text, remember the mini has less parameters. And what that generally means is it's gonna be able to run on less hardware, which is gonna mean less cost. So obviously it generally has less capability, but you can always balance what you really need and work out what's the right model to use. And remember, it's very common today to use multiple models, not modalities. Modalities is, hey, a model supports audio and text and image, for example. And that's fantastic. But it's also going to be times where I want to use multiple models. So maybe I'm having a regular large language model and it spits out text. Well, then I could send that output text to a text-to-speech model to then get an audio output. So it, it's very useful to have models that have specific capabilities to optimize cost and get the entire feature set I actually need. And that was it. As always, I hope this was useful. Till next video, take care.